Good morning, everybody. Today is May 20th, 2021, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, first organized in the spring of 2020 by Natalie Armstrong Motan. We're delighted to bring you these webinars every week. There's no charge for these great webinars. All we ask is that you contribute to a food bank, either one designated by our speaker or one of your own choice, if you like what you see. And if you report your contribution to Natalie, we'll be delighted to add it to our running total so far. And we're so delighted with our audiences over the past year, a year plus a little bit. People have just been so generous. Jean, why don't you fill us in on just exactly what our running total is so far? Well, uh, absolutely. Good morning. The total so far is $10,485. No, wow. 100, 100. I was kidding. $110,485, $485. I saw it. I've been dealing with a three-week-old, you know, so uh, excuse me. Wow. Well, that's well over a million meals for people all around the world dealing with food insecurity. And we thank our generous audiences so much. Today, we're very happy to have Susan Guthrie back as our guest speaker. Susan is nationally recognized as one of the top family law and mediation attorneys in the United States. She's been helping individuals and families navigate separation and divorce for over 30 years. Susan has recently partnered with mediation legend Woody Mostyn to create the Mostyn Guthrie Academy to provide cutting edge gold standard trainings for attorneys, mediators, and other professionals. As a leading dispute resolution professional, Susan is honored to serve on the governing council of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution. She's the membership officer. She's also a co-chair of the mediation committee and the annual Advanced Mediation Skills Institute. Susan is also an internationally well-regarded expert in online mediation and has been training colleagues and other professionals in the practical and ethical considerations of conducting their mediations online with her innovative programs and webinars for more than two years. So far, more than 15,000 dispute resolution professionals have benefited from her program, Learn to Mediate Online. Susan will tell us a little bit about uh, Chicago's food bank. She lives in the Chicago area. And tell us, Susan, a year ago, you came and you told us all we needed to get ring lights, we all got ring lights. I assume that now the advice is going to be uh, far beyond that, what we really need to learn now to stay on the cutting edge. So uh, please tell us about Chicago's Food Bank and for your presentation, our good friend, Susan Guthrie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joff and Jean and Natalie. Thank you, Will Work for Food for what you are doing. Um, the three of you especially, but the, the, this entire series has been so inspiring and it feels so personally um, satisfying to be able to contribute in, in some small way. So I do ask if you have the ability to make a donation, please consider doing so. Um, you know, this is this has been such an amazing, I can't believe $110,000. I mean, that's just, and those are just the people who've reported it in. I suspect there's even more than that. So um, my preferred food bank, just because I am in Chicago, there's a great need um, in our major cities for assistance. Uh, but really, you know, the greater um, Chicago food bank, but any food bank, they are all, um, we have people, in all of our communities who need help. And so that's another reason why I'm thrilled to be back and able to, um, to contribute again in some small way. So if I could share my screen, would that be all right? Um, Natalie, I just wanna, sure. um, I made up some slides because it's easier for me to stay on track and get through everything. Um, if I have slides and as you'll see, I'm a big fan of visual aids and you'll find out why. Um, so let me just flip up my screen here. I would have done all of this if I had been on time. I apologize again, uh, but let's, 
Let's go. All right. So um, advanced issues in the virtual world, because as Jeff pointed out, I've been talking about everything from ring lights and, you know, how to use a breakout room and why you need a separate microphone and all of that till I'm blue in the face for more than a year now. And it's been a delight and a pleasure to help colleagues get online. But now many of us have moved beyond that. And, and so I wanted to sort of talk about where we are today and how we can do what we're doing, but do it a little bit better and also get us ready for what might be coming down the pike. So in today's program, I'll be covering leveraging online commuting. So really taking it to the next level. It is more than just flipping open your computer and start talking on a camera. Um, I'm also going to talk about our changing online environment. There's been a big change lately to Zoom, at least. Um, it's already been out there for teams. People are having a lot of fun playing with this, but I want to talk about you know, what we need to think about as we, as we have a little bit of fun in our lives. Um, hybrid proceedings are our future, and I want to talk about both the technical issues that they raise as well as some of the psychological. And then just because I think we always need to stay on top of ethical considerations as they are ever evolving in the virtual world, I'm not going to talk about our ethical obligations across the board, but there are certain things that come up um, that are very specific and are raised because we're in this virtual world. So I want to touch on some of those. But first, let's just for a moment go back to just over a year ago before these images were dominating our lives, right? Where were we? Oops, sorry, we went backwards. Where were we in March of 2020? And it can be hard to forget, right? Because we are so used now to being, to Zooming and to doing all this. But think back to that period of time where all of a sudden our world was no longer available to us in person. Our clients couldn't come in. We couldn't meet with people. We had to socially distance. So what did we have? We had the steepest learning curve. And that's where I was helping people. But I know there was a great deal of concern and fear around this rapid change we faced. We had to learn all of these words that we probably didn't even know back then. I mean, who really knew what Zoom was 14 or 15? months ago. Now we Zoom all the time. We've turned it into Band-Aid tissue and Zoom. Um, but there's all these other platforms and many people are using different platforms. So it hasn't been just a matter of learning one. It's been a matter of learning multiple platforms. But getting online wasn't just learning how to use video conferencing. It was also learning how to ethically and confidentially and securely transfer and store documents to our clients. This was always an issue. It became even more of an issue when nobody was ever in our personal space to hand us things anymore. And then we had to learn e-signatures because nobody was there to sign anything anymore. So suddenly we had another add-on. And finally, we wanted to get paid, but there was no one there to write us a check or hand us a credit card. So we got used to e-payment. So we had this incredibly vast and huge and rapid shift. And we've done it. I mean, people reportedly, anecdotally, these are all words probably that are very familiar to most of you. Um, now for today, I'm, I am, you know, we've gone to Zoom here. And I'm, when I'm talking about things, I'll be highlighting Zoom mainly because, not because I, I'm endorsing Zoom as the one to go to, but anecdotally and based on all the surveys that I've done of all the people that I have trained, this is where most people have ended up. That's where we are right now. That's where most of us spend our days. So I'll be talking about Zoom. But, you know, Overall, why was this such a, a positive shift? And mainly, and why was Zoom what, you know, where we all went? Mainly because it had the basic functionality that we needed. It had all of our must-haves. And I just want to touch on them, the screen share, that waiting room, breakout rooms, the holy grail. Thank you, Colin Rule. Most people by now know that story that Colin was down the hall and talked the Zoom creators into adding breakout rooms. Thank God for that and our secure chat function. So we, we were able to do by adopting technology, we were able to do what we needed to do. And so once we got over that learning curve, we, were, we quickly learned that most of what we had been doing 
in person could translate online. But what I want to also bring to everyone's attention is as our comfort level with being online has gone up, so has the industry knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. So has research been rapidly shifting to this arena of how this works, how we can do it and how we can do it better. And importantly, there's been a huge shift of venture capital funding and technology innovation into this world so that we can start doing what we do and doing it better. That's all combined to give us more opportunities. In fact, I heard someone in a in a presentation I was doing yesterday say, you know, the world of of online dispute resolution of of many different areas of law have really jumped forward 10 years in the space of one because there was this rapid and forced migration. But in many ways we've got silver linings that come from that. So I want to talk about where we are right now, where the technology is where research has been advanced and what we can incorporate into what we do online that makes it better, that we can either communicate better, as I mentioned earlier, leveraging online communication, using those environments. So starting with leveraging online communication, as I said, what we all did, I think in the beginning, and I'll, I'll put myself in this group back six years ago when I started um, mediating online because I was on different sides of the country from my, my clients. For me, it was just a, a basic matter of I wanted to turn on that camera. I wanted to talk to people and see them. And I wasn't really understanding the neuroscience and the, the psychology behind talking and speaking and communicating with people online. But one of the things that's become very clear to us is that we actually, because we are in such a visual medium, we have unique opportunities to enhance our communication. It's interesting because still today, very much so in the beginning of COVID, but still today, I hear the comment from people, well, it's, you know, this online thing, it's substandard to in-person. You know, you don't have that personal touch you're through a screen, you're missing all that body language. I still get those comments. But in fact, research and psychology say the, that it's the opposite, that you actually have an enhanced capability of communicating online. So why is that? It really comes down to the uneven triad of communication. You've probably heard this referenced, but it truly has a great deal to do with why both anecdotally as well as um, just the psychology and research have backed up why looking at a thumbnail like you're all looking at right now or like you see on this screen with the four people here, why this is actually very well suited to communicating online. And that is that 55% of our communication as humans is through body movements, face and arms. Those facial expressions, I can see some of you on the screen and you know, I see people nodding, I see people tilting their heads, I see Jeff thinking. Um, you know, we get a lot of communication just from what we see. If somebody's doing this, they're either bored or they're thinking or they're paying attention, but we can start to get attention. We can start to get clues from what people are saying. And yes, I'll agree. I know there's people out there thinking, yeah, but you can't see the tapping foot under the conference room table. I get that one all the time. And that's correct. I have to be honest, when I was sitting at my wooden conference table, I wasn't seeing the tapping foot anyway. But what I am seeing are hunched shoulders, furrowed brows, and the hand talking. You also, 38% of our communication is the tone of our voice, the modulation, the way we say things, the pauses in our, in our communication. Only 7% is those words that are coming out. So this means that a medium where we are amplified in our face and amplified in our audio is actually incredibly well suited to communication. And this is just, I, I love this study that was done. There have been seven 
um, sort of universal emotional expressions that have been identified. Happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, contempt, and surprise. There are many, many other subcategories under there. But they did a study where they went off to Borneo and found a, a, a tribe that had not had a lot of communication with the outside world. And in communicating, they were taking pictures of a gentleman's face. And I'm going to just show him here. Um, and found that it was very easy to see in his facial expressions which of the seven universal facial expressions he was exhibiting, even though they had no other language between them um, than the, the expressions. So it's easy to see an A here. I mean, anyone want to take a guess on where he's going? Throw it into the chat there. I mean, you see the, the curves around his lips. The eyebrows are spread apart. The, I'll call them smile lines alongside his eyes, right? This is happiness. Um, but in the middle, we've got a very distinctly different facial expression. We now have the lines between the eyes. My, my doctor calls them the 11s, you know, the, the two lines, the drawn compressed lips and the, the, the eyebrows that are down. This is anger. This is really easy to, that comes across. And then the last one, I mean, I immediately look at it and feel the sadness, right? You know, the, the loose lips, but the, the, um, the eyebrows that are down at the edges, um, the downward gaze. So this is just an example of how easy it is for us to read the expressions and the emotions and communicate online through facial expression. So how can we, as people who are communicating online, use this information? I love this guy. I had to include his pictures just because he's a really good example of, you know, this is, this is not just his facial expression. It's the body language. But we're getting a good idea of what this guy is thinking. So what do we do? Well, you have to make sure this goes to that pre-mediation or pre-meeting or pre-legal proceeding prep. You have to make sure that you have good video and audio and that your client or your experts or everybody else does. You need to make sure that both you and your participants, anyone who's on your team, knows to use vis visible body language, um, shrugging your shoulders, using your hands. A person who uses their hands down here just looks like they're having the shakes. Um, you have to maximize eye contact. This is truly one of the most important, and it really is more about camera placement than it is anything about actually being able to make um, eye contact. Right now, I'm looking directly at Jeff Kitchhaven. I don't know if it looks to you, hi Jeff, if I'm making eye contact with you, um, and then when I look at my camera. But it's really important that people understand that. And one of the things that I think many of us as practitioners have found during the past 14, 15 months is that it's easy to work off, easier to work off of more than one screen when we're actually doing a mediation in a hearing at trial working even with a client. And that means that a lot of the time you're going to be over here looking at that screen or over here looking at that screen. And that's maybe a necessary part of it. I work off of three screens when I am in, in a session, um, but I make sure to let people know what I'm doing. I'm going to be, I have two screens here, Bob, and I, you know, I do family mediation, so I usually just have the two parties, but I tell them, I have two screens here, don't think I'm not listening or paying attention to you. If I'm turned this way, I'm probably, I'm on my other screen, and when I do it, I tell them, or if it's a really important conversation, take a pause on those other screens for a moment and make sure that you make that eye contact. And then make sure that you listen carefully because it is, again, in those nuances of tone and the you know, spacing of words as opposed to the words where we get so much of our communication. But overall, the key that I want to get across here is if you are a person who has been convinced that online communication is substandard, consider that perhaps it's not. Consider that perhaps that that is a viewpoint and that in fact, science, neuroscience and psychology say the opposite. There's also this, this um, just shift to using more visuals online. 
in it, you know, back when I started mediating online, I noticed that, you know, usually in, as a divorce mediator, we have a sequence of sessions, two, three hours at a time. And I noticed over time that it just seemed like my matters were resolving more quickly. And I didn't really understand why, what was it about being online? And it turns out as I've, I've put more time thought into it and done more research, it's likely because of the visual nature of the online process. And that is because you can use a, the visual much more effectively online when we're all looking at the same screen. And our brains process visuals 60,000 times faster than text, 60,000 times faster. So if you can turn something, you'll notice I have a lot of, uh, I'll have slides here. They're colorful, they have pictures. I'm getting my point across with less words and more pictures to get attention and to get the point across. It's the same thing in an online meeting, in an online uh, hearing, in an online mediation. And these are just a few more facts. These all grabbed my attention, but the one, 40% of people respond better to visuals. I think we all know that we all have different learning styles, but the largest category is people responding and learning from visuals. So what does that mean for us as online practitioners or online people who are working in an online environment? It means that screen share is a huge opportunity for us that many of us are not using to its full capacity. So where does that take us? How can, what are some ways you can envision using visuals in your online process whether it's mediation or hearing or an arbitration. Um, I don't know if anyone out there is using visuals. I have um, a great deal. I have incorporated a, a large number of different ways. And here's some of the, the things that I will do during one of my, mer uh, my divorce mediations. I use spreadsheets all the time um, because somebody usually walks through the door with one where they've already done all the work and said, yeah, here's how this should work. I've, I've already figured it out. But when you're talking about numbers, it's, it's one thing. When you put them up on the screen and can move them around, it's, people absorb that information a great deal faster. I also work off of a written agenda. Um, that helps people because we can take notes, we can be helping them remember the facts, we can move things around, we can change the colors. I do support calculations using the whiteboard. Um, if I'm doing a calendar, like a parenting calendar, I actually put the calendar right up on the screen. And I have started incorporating a great deal more uh, use of pictures and videos into my mediations. And that's in different ways. And again, I can only speak to what I've been doing in family mediations, but a couple of examples. Um, in cases where we're having some difficulty in the parenting plan discussions, sometimes I'll pop up a picture of the kids very effective when mom and dad are going down one of the rabbit holes of conflict um, or having a very hard time focusing on their children as opposed to their conflict. Um, so I, that's always been a part of my practice is I had have parents give me pictures of their children, but I found it's very effective in bringing them, the kids back into the room and getting people back on, on track. I also use videos. Um, again, in that parenting realm, there's a video a documentary out there called Split that's about the effect of um, divorce on children. And sometimes we'll watch that in a mediation session. Other ways people are using video is day in the life videos, um, videos that will describe um, something that is happening in a client's life that make it more descriptive than just talking about it. There's a million ways we can incorporate it. The key is, again, being aware and thinking of ways we can visualize this. I was talking to another mediator the other day. She's in Italy, and she, um, she does mediations and just draws stick figure pictures and arrows and uses color. She said she's a horrible artist. But her clients love it because it's very easy for them. So she just uses her whiteboard on the screen and uses that and says that it's incredi been incredibly helpful and clients do the same, same thing. There's also, I, I mentioned all of this major shift to technology and um, adding assistive technology to our practice. I'm just going to talk about one 
program just because I personally implemented this one into my practice. Um, not intended to be an endorsement, just intended to, to talk about things to look for out there. Um, I was talking to Gary Dornhafer, the, the founder of ADR Noble, who comes from a legal background. He was in-house counsel for American Airlines for eons and, and multiple of other roles. Um, and he said, this is, he, they started creating it just before COVID. And he said, he, they started creating ADR Notable to bring the computer into the mediation room. And I find that so fascinating because now the mediation room is the computer. And what I find so helpful with this particular program, it does a myriad of things. It's in, this one's intended to take you from before the mediation all the way through the end of the mediation and beyond. But it has this note-taking capability, and this is where I've gone. You can see it in the picture. This is the screen where you can be taking notes. Um, and you can be taking notes on issues and highlighting who um, raised the issue, proposals, facts, and then I always have a fourth row that is agreements. And each one of these little lines, you is I think of them as sticky notes. You can just pick them up and drag them over. So if one of your issues goes with one of the proposals, you can attach it there. And then when the proposal is accepted, I don't know if you can see the little thumbs ups, but you can hit a thumbs up and it'll go over to the, uh, to the agreement section. My clients absolutely love this. I share the screen. They can see me moving things around. They honestly get invested in moving things and pushing things around. Yes, somebody asked me yesterday when I was showing this, can you... Um, take notes that they can't see. Yes, you can blur your notes. So those might be things if you're told in confidence or there's something you didn't want to share, um, you can blur certain things, but you can share this with them by either having it on a separate screen or having it on the same um, computer that you are working on. It also then has templates that you can upload. It also has its own templates. It has e-signatures, it has e-payments. All of it shown on the screen as a way for your participants to be actively engaged in what's happening. So just one other example. So those are some of the ways that we can in, in, integrate our understanding of psychology to communicate better, as well as using some up-to-date technology to enhance that visual aids. But we also have, I know people have gotten very excited in the last couple of weeks with the, uh, the new uh, immersive views that Zoom has dropped. Um, so what virtual meetings look like now is much like what we're in, right? We're in a virtual meeting. It looks like these two lovely ladies. This might actually look like one of my same sex um, mediations, right? The two, two ladies together, very simple, very equal. But now Zoom has, and I believe Teams has, and it's coming in all venues. Um, oh wait, I had to add this one in because this, this picture just brings me such joy and makes me smile every time. I got about literally about 120 emails at the time this came out to make sure that I had seen it. So we all know this is what a Zoom hearing looks like today. You knew what was coming, right? But it just gives me joy. Um, I love that, the, the I'm here, Your Honor, I'm not a cat. Um, but this is taking away the kitty cat face. This is very much what a Zoom hearing looks like today when you're attending a hearing, a trial, Everyone's there. Everyone's a screen that's equal in size. Um, our background is whatever we've chosen it to be. Well, with, with the new immersive views, this is what our hearings can look like. This is what our meetings can look like now. And you can see it completely changes the feeling of the environment when you add an immersive view. Um, for a trial, going for that very serious feeling. Look at her honor with the seal of the great state of somewhere behind her um, and our juror sitting here in their jury box and our very serious attorney sitting in, at council table. You get that feeling of being in a courtroom, which might be helpful. I don't know if you were doing a more casual meeting, this would be a particularly good environment. And over here, we have a much more equal environment. This is one of Zoom's um, uh, six person, they have immersive views that will hold a number, a certain number of people. Um, so in some ways, this one can be very helpful if you're trying to have that same feeling like you did in that prior hearing, 
so that everyone's equal and in the same place. And you can move the participants around just as you can with the squares. But what we need to be aware of when we go to create our own immersive virtual conference room, because that's the additional technology that is available. You can upload your own immersive view to Zoom and have your own, say, conference room or your own hearing room or your own office as the background that you're then going to sit people in. But consider the effect of the environment on what you want to do and what the feeling is and what the psychology is of the feeling of what you're trying to create. Because sometimes it might be better to stay with this. There's a great deal of parity and even handedness in this view. This is one of the reasons psychologically that Zoom and online meetings have actually worked well for things like mediation or dispute resolution where we don't want people to feel um, that that in uh, imbalance um, or where you have the team on one side of, you know, attorney, attorney, paralegal, adjuster, um, et cetera. And then over on the other side, you have maybe one person, maybe two people. On this screen, that's less noticeable. That's less of a feeling. So I'm not saying don't use them. I'm saying be judicious in your choice and very thoughtful before you use them. Right now, I think they're a novelty. Down the road, I think they're going to become much more ubiquitous and we will be using them. But I, I'm going to be un uploading my own um, and only using them in certain circumstances. This is actually a very effective format. Susan, I have, let me ask a, a question. Absolutely. I, I find, and some other mediators uh, I've heard have found that we can have, in commercial cases, more joint sessions, more direct communication because people are in the home environment. They're more relaxed in the home environment. With the immersive environment, if you try to recreate a conference room, do you create more of that Coliseum-like environment and induce gladiator-style behavior, whereas otherwise, uh, here in my spare bedroom or, or your virtual uh, den there, it's more relaxed? Are we going to lose that? I Absolutely, right? That's exactly that point. Now, in some circumstances, that may be the effect that you want. You want it to be a serious matter. You want it to be a serious proceeding. If you're taking a deposition online, you may want your deponent to be taking it very seriously and realize that this is um, a serious proceeding. But if you are doing um, a mediation, for example, um, where you want your participants to be able to take advantage of the psychological fact, as you point out, Jeff, that they are in their own environment. Very often, I just talked about this with Deborah Dupree, a friend of mine. I think Deborah's done one of the, we will, yes. So Deborah was pointing out the psych, the neurobiology actually of being in your own environment, surrounded by your dog and your own stuff sitting on your couch means that you're, you're releasing less cortisol, less adrenaline. You don't have that fight or flight at the same level that you might in some stranger's conference room. So all of a sudden we're going to throw that conference room up on the screen, even in you know, a picture, yes, I absolutely agree with you, Jeff. And that's why I say, be very judicious in your use. Think about the effect you're trying to create um, and, and think about whether it's appropriate because for most of us, especially if we are the dispute resolution professional, for those who are out there, we're in charge of the process, right? We create that process for the participants. That's a part of our job. So be creating the atmosphere, the, the environment that is conducive to what we want to do for those people. And again, it may be very different for an advocate um, or in a trial or hearing setting. Thank you, Jeff, because I think that's such a critical point. Um, now, where we're going, um, and I, I do think we're, we're already starting to see this, um, and I think we will get there uh, very rapidly as COVID starts to move beyond. What's the last my Here we go. We're moving to the world of hybrid um, meetings. We are moving to a place where some of our participants are going to be with us. 
People want to get back together. We're hearing all about it day in and day out now. It has its own stressors about getting back together right now. But then there are going to be participants who are all in on the conveniences of being remote. So there are kind of two ways that I see the remote playing out. I see where we might do all of our pre-hearing, pre-mediation prep and do that virtually so that we're not drawing people together over and over again, but then doing the actual process in person. And I don't think that creates quite the same challenges, but where I see challenges are where we have, as in this case. So this is, this is actually a mediation I have going on right now where one person is present with me and one person is beaming in remotely. Um, and I can tell you that this is creates, well, first let's talk about this. So um, there are already statistics out there that say over 25% of all meetings, now this is all general business meetings, but this is well COVID restrictions are generally still in place, although they're lightening up as we speak, uh, but 25% are already hybrid. And I truly believe that hybrid is going to become the norm. And in fact, I'm not the only one who thinks that. Go Google like Logitech or Zoom or any of the major tech companies. They are all throwing money at this. They are all throwing technology and innovation at this particular issue because it is going to be so critical as we go forward. And so for we as practitioners, being prepared for this, is really going to be critical and is giving us an opportunity to sort of be well positioned as it comes along. So part of being well positioned is being aware of what the issues are and they are both practical and psychological. And the practical is somewhat easy to see, right? You know, I did this um, not long ago where I was um, beaming into a conference room in California, I'm in Chicago, beaming into California as the, I called myself the great and powerful Oz because I was the giant head on the wall. They had a big TV screen in the room, but my co-mediator and the two people getting divorced were in that same room together. And it was a constant struggle for me to see them because they had set up a, a laptop underneath the big screen where my head was floating, but it was like clear on the other side of the conference room. They were all artificially squashed together very close to each other at the other end of the table so that I, the camera on the laptop could get all of them in the picture. And they, so they were very far away as well from the camera. So they were all little itty bitty figures that I could see them but I couldn't see them. And we've talked about how important it is that I be able to hear. And the microphone, they were using the microphone on the laptop as well, which was also quite far away. So half the time when they were turned to my co-mediator and talking to him, which is very natural, right? They turned to the person in the room, I couldn't hear what they were saying. So the tech, the tech aspect of that was a big problem. Um, and it takes obviously forethought. And I had another person suggest, well, why don't you just have every person on a laptop? Uh, that's how school, many schools that have gone back to some in-person and some hybrid are doing that right now. And one of my um, friend's kids was just talking to me the other day and said, you know, you go to school and you're sitting there with your headphones on and you're looking at your screen and the teacher's up at the front of the room looking at their screen and all the other students are looking at their screen and then there's a large TV in the room that shows all the thumbnails of the students who are remote. So although they're there together, they're, you know, cushioned audibly from all of the other participants because they have to wear headphones because of the feedback issues. And they're all staring at a screen and communicating with people through the screen, not in the room. So that's another issue. Susan, there's, the, a, there's a question in the chat about ADA compliance. Do you give much thought to that in connection, particularly with these hybrid proceedings? So from the perspective of languaging? Of making, well, of making sure that people with disabilities can participate appropriately in the mediations. Have those issues come up for you? Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, they come up whether it's a hybrid proceeding or an in-person proceeding or an online proceeding, accommodations 
need to be made depending on what the disability we're dealing with might be. In fact, one of the things I've always found to be extremely helpful about online mediations and proceedings is that it's easier for people with disabilities to participate in many circumstances. Um, but as with anything, you have to know about what you need to deal with and set that up ahead of time. It may mean additional technology, um, but uh, Zoom has a great transcription um, process that you can get now. It's, a, it's an upsell, it's gonna cost more money, uh, but you can, I know people who use Google Slides uh, because they have a pretty good transcription record um, where they can do that along the bottom. So if you have a deaf um, or, or a person with hearing disabilities, you can, you know, you can have closed captioning, so to speak. Uh, there's a myriad of different ways to do it. I had um, a client who was a quadriplegic and I started pre-COVID doing mediations with him coming to my office. And I have to tell you, by the time he even just got to my office, he was exhausted and frazzled because it was just a huge process to get him there. And then to expect him to sit through a couple of hours of divorce mediation was, was quite a lot of wear and tear on him. When we started doing it virtually for him, it was much easier for him to participate, but we did have to make accommodations in that sense as well. So absolutely, um, I think that in the hybrid situation, you're going to have people who want to participate remotely because that's easier for them, but they do need to understand there's going to be some practical and psychological components. Um, and those psychological components are very real. Um, and you will have that fact. They've, they've done studies just on remote workforces. So think about where we're going just with your average business. I know my husband's business is about to open up and people will be in person, but they're also going to keep a lot of their team remote. They've done a lot of research on this. And just that fact of some people being in the room together and some people being on that screen creates almost a, a, the us versus them mentality um, where it's teams suddenly, the aways and the in-persons, right? And that's a subtle, perhaps unconscious feeling, but it's very real for people. And think about the implications of that in a mediation, say, where you, know, you have one of your participants or your participant and their counsel separate and then one set in the office. Um, you also can have the psychology of just what I described, where when I was co-mediating and was he the head on the wall, you have the people who are turning toward the other mediator constantly in that process because they're all in that room. And you have that person who's can be marginalized or feel marginalized. Now, that doesn't impact me as a mediator so much, but it very well may impact one of your participants. So what can we do? Well, one of the practical solutions, I'm gonna talk about the practical first. As I mentioned, technology is rapidly shifting to this sector. There's a lot out there. Two possibilities are you, there is um, in-office technology that we can now, it's um, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence assisted cameras and microphone suites that can be installed in our offices. And I'm gonna show you an example of what that looks like. That's expensive, right? That's technology, it's cutting edge, it's just coming out. I know Logitech has something called Rally Bar Mini and Rally Bar. I think the minimum cost on that is $2,500. So that may be prohibitive depending on your office and your, your budget. Many of the um, rental suites or the rental offices, things like Regus, WeWork, those sorts of places, they are also installing rental virtual suites. And that may be a much more effective um, thing for people um, who don't want to spend the money on something. I had someone say the other day on something that might be obsolete in a year. We, I, I can't say it won't be. I mean, our technology is rapidly changing, but right now this is what we have to deal with it. Um, so those are two possibilities. So recently, um, Jeff Zeno, who's one of my colleagues at the ABA, 
DR section, they in their New York offices have installed a virtual suite. It's brand new. Um, and so we, we did a video for another program we were doing, and I have their permission to show it to you, what the artificial intelligence um, assisted cameras do. It also will show you some of how we need to uh, make some changes to how we do things. But I'm, I'd like to play this for you. I'm going to stop the share for a sec just to make sure that I have um, it optim share sound. Okay. Um, let me just want to make sure you can all hear this. So this is about uh, three minutes long, but it'll give you a good idea of what this will look like. Welcome everyone. I'm Susan Guthrie, your mediator in this dispute involving Long Island Art Workshop and Queens Construction. I wanna thank you all for selecting me as your mediator and I hope that we're going to be able to reach settlement today. I've read through all of your pre-mediation submissions and I believe that this is a perfect case for mediation and settlement. Let's review some of the initial ground rules for today. Um, you know that I, your mediator, am remote, and counsel and parties are both located in the AAA ICDR offices in New York. So when we need to meet individually with one party and or, and or one party in their counsel, I'm going to ask that the other party wait in the room next door. So let's do some quick introductions. Um, Mr. Zeno, if you'd go first. Great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Guthrie, Guthrie, and thank you for being here today. And uh, I'm Jeff Zano, counsel for Long Island Art Workshop. This is my client, Ann Lesser, the president of the Long Island Workshop. Thank you, Mr. Zano. And Ms. Vega. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Guthrie. I'm Jacqueline Vega, counsel for Queens Construction, and this is my client, Michael Mara, the owner of the company. Thank you both. Um, so let me hear why we're here today. Um, if I could have a quick summary, first from you, Mr. Zeno, and then from you, Ms. Vega. Well, thank you. Well, bottom line, uh, Queens Construction did a horrible job constructing an additional art studio for Long Island Artworks. Uh, there were delays, cost overruns, and the job is still not completed. Still not completed. Frankly, the site is now very, very dangerous. Now, this is ridiculous. I will not have my good name slandered today. The reason the job is not completed is because you, Ms. Lesser, will not let my team back on the property. This is insane. Mr. Mara, the reason this job is not completed is because you were doing a terrible job, and I had to stop you from destroying my pre-existing structure. And, and, please, we cannot have this turn into a shouting match. Please. Yes, 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 Counselor. You should really learn how to control your crazy client. Okay, I'm going to stop it there, but I think you get an idea. I had some great actors who were really getting into their parts. So you can see as people speak, these cameras are sound activated. The artificial intelligence knows to move amongst the people who are speaking. You also saw a visible error, right? Or a visible shortcoming is that when someone says, this is my client so-and-so, if so-and-so doesn't say something, then so-and-so doesn't get shown on the screen. So as we go into working with these, these virtual technology suites and this AI-assisted cameras and microphones, we will need to be more aware of making sure that people are verbalizing um, so that it would have been an easy fix that for the client, to, uh, for the attorney to say, please say hello, Anne, or please, uh, you know, introduce yourself, Michael. Um, so those are things we're going to have to learn. I'm just pointing that out because to me, it was a super obvious thing after we taped this. Um, but you can also see that you could pretty easily follow what was going on. Now, another person raised when I sh we showed this yesterday in our program, why on earth would you put two, two, the two sides together in a, in a room without having a neutral mediator with them? You might not. I mean, we were doing this to tape it and show the efficacy of the, um, of the technology, not so much as an example of what you might do, but you might do this um, in a virtual suite where say you want to work with a particular mediator or arbitrator or whomever it might be, and they're not available in person, but you wanna work with them. So there may be certain circumstances we're going to have to modify how we do things, but I think you can see so that the sound 
was good. You could hear everything that everyone was saying. You could see what everyone was saying and see it. And what you was hard to see there is they also had me as that big floating head on the wall. Susan, from your perspective as professional mediator, were you pleased with the interactions that you saw in that video? And what sort of intervention could you do from hundreds of miles away on a screen? Well, and if we had gone through to, to the rest of it, but I didn't want to take up all the time since we're almost at the end. But um, yes, I mean, obviously there would have been issues with that type of interaction that was going on. And I probably would have intervened, but we were working off of a specific um, uh, script because AAA is using this video for a, a particular reason. Um, so we needed the conflict. Um, and they they did it quite well. But you still, I mean, don't underestimate the fact that you can intervene verbally in that sort of a setting, even if you're not physically there. I think that's one thing that we've learned, right? You don't need to be in the room um, in order to take control of the room. Uh, and so I do a lot of training, a lot of working with clients, et cetera, where it's all virtual, you can still be the person who is leading the charge. Um, and, and there would have been ground rules and all the things that we as mediators do ahead of time, which would have given me something to interrupt with. But it, it, truly this was more to show you the technology than the, the how to be a mediator, okay? So, um, so that's what's, there's also the psychological that I just want to touch on, and I know we'll run up a, 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 to time here, but there are psychological issues that go along with this, this hybrid possibility as well. And what can we do? You know, what can we do about these issues? Well, awareness of them is, as with everything, the first key, right? We need to know that the issues exist, and we need to educate and make all our other participants aware of this. We may have situations where people are going to say to us, great, it's fine with me that the other side's going to be present with you in the mediation room or arbitration. But gosh, you know, I really don't feel like dealing with the 405 um, I, and I, I'm going to choose to, to beam in. They may choose to do that, which is great, but they need to know ahead of time that there may be consequences to that. There may be these feelings of being marginalized or the feelings of the psychological. Making people aware of those effects gives them the opportunity to make an educated choice. And we, as the, the if you're the mediator, the arbitrator, the, the facilitator, the attorney in the room, we also need to make an effort to continue to be aware of this phenomena ourselves and do things to ameliorate it, such as, Bob, I know I've been turned to Mary talking to her a great deal and hearing from her, and I want her to know I'm hearing her. Please know that I'm going to give you the same opportunity and I will be able to focus on you as well. I know it can feel that you're, you know, you're separate and apart because you're remote. Just know that this is, you know, I'm paying attention and I know that. So we will need to make more of an effort if we choose to participate in these hybrid meetings. And that's, you know, that's another option is to not allow, I talked to someone yesterday in a presentation I was doing who just said, well, I'm just not going to do them. You're either going to be in person or you're going to be remote. And that is another option. Whether it's a good business decision remains to be seen. And then I'm just going to touch quickly on a couple of ethical issues in the virtual world. Um, and again, these are not ethical issues in the entire practice of law or mediation or dispute resolution. But the one I mainly want to make people aware of is the, the ones of the issues of unconscious bias. And they stem from very common things that go on because we're online. So think of those times where you've been on a, a Zoom meeting or on a virtual meeting and somebody is having tech issues. Somebody is, you know, having wonky Wi-Fi and so they're freezing constantly, or somebody doesn't log on on time and you're stuck waiting for them for five minutes while they're searching for the link. That was me earlier today. Think about the frustration and, and the feelings that you feel. Think about when you have a participant who just doesn't know what they're doing. And so you have a mediator or a judge who's constantly saying, no, 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 it's that, it's that button in the corner, click the one, no, it looks like a microphone. Another level of irritation. How about the poor netiquette? 
How about the person who forgets to mute themselves and has their kids yelling in the background and the dog barking and the doorbell ringing? And how about people who choose not to participate by video because they're having, as I've heard more times than I can count, a bad hair day or haven't had time to clean up their room? Do they need to know that they are creating a situation where they are perhaps uh, biasing themselves or putting themselves in a subpar communication situation? These are all things that we need to be aware of because they are so common online and they create those feelings of irritation. All these stem from under that anger. Remember the seven um, you know, expressions? Anger has irritation, frustration, et cetera. So we need to make sure that we prep our clients, our participants, and ourselves so that we don't have these issues. And, and I don't just tell people, well, make sure you know how to use Zoom before you log on. I tell them why it's so important. You don't want to be this person who's creating these issues. And then I'm not going to go do the deep dive into the limits of online confidentiality because we have the expert on the screen here, Jeff Kitchhaven, um, who's, I've got my, my poster right over here, Jeff, but I, I should have had it ready to go. Um, but I wanted to just bring everyone's attention to it because this continues to be an issue. And I think it's becoming more and more of an issue because of unintended third parties, the issues of recording and transmission, the fact that our participants are often in different jurisdictions, and case law continues to emerge. So I'm just gonna leave this here because I have a solution for you all. And then I also wanna point out that there is a critical need for cybersecurity. I think this whole pipeline issue and people not having enough gas, I mean, it just shows. And again, I'm not going to do a deep dive because we have the expert in this area on screen, Gene Lawler, um, who has done a great deal of study and has been certified in this area. What I did want to bring to all of your attention is both of these two have come on my podcast and done, I believe, um, episodes for Will Work for Food on these topics. I strongly urge you to listen. They know what they're talking about. These are things that we as professionals need to be aware of and that are continuing to change. Um, so I just bring you your attention to them and to those ethical issues. I think it's very important for us. Um, and then I know I've reached the end of my time. I'm happy to answer questions if you would like me to stay on. If not, you can all feel free to reach out to me, send an email. I love answering questions, so please feel free. Um, if you do want to listen to the podcast, the um, it's Podlink, uh, Learn to Mediate Online, LTMO, or it's on all podcast um, channels, whatever your favorite one to listen to is. Susan, that was just fantastic. Thank you so much. We're a little past the top of the hour, so I do want to bring us to a close. I want to remind everyone, if they're in a position to support a food bank, if you're able to support the Greater Chicago Food Depository in Susan's honor, that would be wonderful. Their URL is www.chicagosfoodbank.org. Chicago with an S at the end, foodbank.org. So please contribute there if you're able. And that was just wonderful. Thank, thank you again. A lot of very practical, insightful knowledge that people can put to work for themselves and the people with whom we're working in mediations right away. Uh, Natalie, Jean, any last comments? I just say thank you, Susan. I took your course a year ago, November, and never imagined where it would take me. So thank you so much for everything you do. Oh, absolutely. I am so, you have been a shining star of what can happen. <laughs> uh, so I use you as an example all the time. Natalie? Susan, I, I, again, thanks for coming back. We know this is your second time presenting to Will Work for Food. We really, really appreciate your expertise and your devotion to our industry. I know that a lot of people, a lot of my clients, have taken great advantage of your courses and do a much better job for their clients and their parties. So thanks for that. Well, well thank you all. Thank you, Natalie. All right, friends. See you next week. With that, we are complete. Thank you, everyone. Bye.